So this panel is um, what we might call the second in a series. Uh, last year we interviewed a panel of museum directors from MoMA, LACMA, two or three other museums and had an enormous uh, audience on Zoom, um, hundreds of people, and this will reach the same number because we have a videographer uh, who is filming this and it will be online. But you get to see it first and before it's edited. Um, this year it's the curators. Last year, as I mentioned, the uh, directors. And this is really a very eminent and distinguished uh, group of curators of prints, all of them well known, I suspect, to uh, most of you. So the intros will be very short. Uh, if we were to list all their many degrees, awards, honors, articles, awards, exhibitions, awards twice because they've all gotten so many, uh, we'd, we'd, be here, we'd be here truly all day. So um, a sentence or two about each of these uh, wonderful people and friends. My very old friend, Jonathan Bover, all the way to your left, the head of prints and drawings, his official title, Head of Prints and Drawings of the National Gallery. His official title is the Andrew W. Mellon Senior Curator of Prints and Drawings at the National Gallery of Art, Washington, D.C. He's been at the National Gallery since 2011. Next up, uh, Stephen Capel from the British Museum in London, where he is head of modern and contemporary prints and drawings. Nadine. Ornstein, whom I've known since she was a student, uh, to my left. She is the Drew Hines curator in charge of the Department of Drawings and Prints at the Metropolitan Museum of Art here in New York, where she has been since 1992. And to her left, Naoko Takahatake. She is curator of prints and drawings at the Getty in Los Angeles, where she has been since 2019. Previously, she was curator of prints and drawings at the Los Angeles Museum, County Museum of Art. So let's get right into it. We don't have that much time, and I don't know about all of you, our team up here, uh, but I frequently get this from collectors. Quote, I'm not interested in prints. What I want is an original, not a multiple. End of quote. How do you guys, how do all of you respond to that? Jonathan? You're first up. Go ahead. What do you say? Or do you get it? Do people say it to you? Uh, no, I'd say, yeah, certainly. But I mean, with this audience, I, I think we all take for granted that at least fine prints, as we, you know, the adjective means works of art uh, of, of inherent quality. What one of my Hold the mic a little. Oh, I'm sorry. One of my responses to students uh, was, or has always been, um, all right, original work, you know, what do you mean? Nelson Goodman, the great esthetician, describes prints, characterizes prints as two-stage autographic. That is, the initial, the mark making is, of course, a creative act. The printing is a creative act. And of course, within the printing, there are many stages, there are many hands. Um, and so I'd say, all right, we are still we inherit a romantic, a post-romantic notion of originality, that it must be unique, indivisible, and so forth. But prints are doubly original. There are two stages of this creativity. And so by definitions that for many periods of history have even been the dominant ones, they are the superior, they are the more artistic form. Moreover, that, and I, come on, we don't have enough time for me to you know, keep, keep riffing. I too happily riff on things like this, which is why David has me up here. But no, that is also why the two-stage autographic nature, this double originality of prints, is also an essential, it's the foundation of why prints are the most extraordinarily rich and telling of all visual forms. Because in multiplicity, you have, from the moment of creation, the possibility, the possibility, the fact of physical, of geographic distribution, and because you have that stage, the articulation of the matrix, matrix surviving, it means the creativity, the creation of the work, 
continues through time. So geographic radius, creativity through time, what can be a more superior, a more uh, potent, pregnant visual form, form of visual art than that? Naoko, do you get any pushback from, I don't know, other curators at the museum in terms of prints being poor second-class citizens and paintings are more important or sculpture? Well, the Getty Museum um, and the Research Institute where prints, the print collection is housed work collaboratively. We work collaboratively in terms of our acquisitions, in terms of our programming. And I like to think of the print as having that great potential to be the connective tissue across our collections. Um, and so in that regard, no. I would think they come to us often, actually, to be able to contextualize the works, the narratives that they're trying to tell through their own collections. Um, and, you know, as Jonathan points out, it's that opportunity for, you know, the print as a medium that really allows for artistic dialogue across geography, across time. And so the print's collection really supports that. Um, so, you know, we have, I, I don't think there is at all a sense of pushing back um, in that regard. I think we are very much needed. Um, Thank you very much. Um, Nadine. The, the Met really has a fabulously robust program of print exhibitions, your Renaissance of Etching being uh, one of my favorite exhibitions ever at the Met. Do you think the Met overall is great at spreading the message that prints matter? Um, I, well, I think we... we Ha I think we are, and we, it's really one of our missions to uh, make people aware of prints. We have a fantastic collection, about a million and a half works in our collection alone, for everything from baseball cards to uh, great works by you know, Rembrandt, Degas, and, um, and our uh, prints and drawings galleries are in a main hallway that you pass through on the way to the 19th century galleries and uh, eventually the new modern wing. So um, uh, it's a... Uh, it's a place where we can show people uh, highlights of our collection and uh, we get a lot of comments from people who love going through that gallery and every 14 weeks it changes and we get to bring out other things from our collection. We're also, you know, very, uh, 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 you know, we're thoughtful about um, have, uh, working with the IFPDA to do a print event, uh, print, uh, you know, symposium or scholars day every year and bring, uh, introduce people to projects that are going on not only in our museum, but, uh, you know, other parts of the world. This year we had speakers from Holland, from Italy and, and other places. Um, so we really try, I mean, I, I wrote my dissertation on prints. I love prints and I really try to get the word out about prints and we're, very lucky uh, that our director, Max Holine, also is a supporter of Prince and in our new uh, Tang Wing that will be um, constructed in, over the next six or seven years, um, which is for modern contemporary art, uh, we expect to have prints throughout the galleries there. Yeah, we had Max in one of our Zooms uh, fairly recently. Uh, last year, I last think. Last year, yeah. last fall and his enthusiasm and his knowledge, his deep knowledge yeah. of Prince was really uh, eye-opening and, and I think wonderful for all of us in the print world. Stephen, British Museum, I've always admired, first place I think that I know of, that had a work of art on paper on view permanently, the big Renaissance uh, cartoon. Um, the, the Michelangelo cartoon, um, do you think that prints really have a certain kind of equity and inclusion at the British Museum, let's say, putting it that way, in a, not quite a political sense, but um, can you pick up your mic before you address the question? Sure. Hold it close. Thank you. Um, well, prints have been an essential part of the British Museum's collection since its foundation with the uh, Hans, Sir John, Hans Sloan collection, uh, bequest of 1753. So, um, Hans Sloan collected not only Dürer, but also contemporary prints like Hogarth. And the museum's collection of prints is 
uh, a collection of collections. So I mentioned Sloan, but there are major bequests from a former trustee, uh, Crash Road from 1799. Then throughout the 19th century, major gifts, um, the uh, William Mitchell collection of Dura woodcuts, um, German woodcuts, and so on, right through Campbell Dodgson's bequest. He was a keeper of uh, prints and drawings in his bequest in the, in the 1940s. Um, and it continues to this day. We have, at the moment, uh, an amazing gift given by, made by Hamish Parker, um, which looks at prints and drawings from 1960 to, to, the, to now. Um, and that built his collection was inspired by seeing a bequest of Alexander Walker, which we showed in 2004, which came to the British Museum. And that example of a collector forming a collection with the British Museum as its ultimate destination is something um, we've always encouraged. Um, Let me also ask you this. Our, our great Museum of Modern Art here in New York, of course, now has works of art on paper hanging with paintings uh, throughout the museum, and that's wonderful to see. My guess is that most visitors make no distinction between a painting and a print. It's a work of art, which is what we all love to see. Right. Has the British Museum made any steps in that direction at all? Well, let's begin. Um, the British Museum isn't, oh, sorry, an art museum. It's a museum of ancient civilizations, cultures from all over the world, um, both in time and space. And so, uh, and furthermore, it's not a museum which has paintings or sculpture. Um, so the prints support um, the other departments. Sometimes they're included in um, exhibitions that we do, major exhibitions on, might be, um, uh, it may even be on Babylonian, the Babylonian period will include some later prints which look at um, depictions of the Tower of Babel, for instance, just a minor example. But um, we do have a dedicated gallery for prints and drawings, and we are able to do changing exhibitions, and this is a way of getting the print collection out to the public. It's a collection which has over 50,000 drawings and some close to two million prints. And the majority, great majority of the, nearly 90% of it is all online um, and with images. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, so uh, Nadine wants to comment on the question. <laughs> Sorry, I was I, not criticizing the question. I just wanted to say something related to your question is about um, works uh, on view where some people don't really make a distinction. And, and the fact is, since uh, printmaking started, prints had a wide range of reasons for being. And some people like them because uh, they are artworks, uh, inexpensive, uh, it's the gateway, as some people gateway to, to the art world for collectors, beginning collectors. But you know, then there's like the print geeks who love them because they like looking at the states and the, how it was made and all of this stuff. And, and so I think you know, the thing about prints, which is wonderful, is they can be pre appreciated on many levels. And so some people will want them because they decorate their apartment and other people want them because they're looking at like how uh, something was made. And, and, you know, and some people like it because it is a uh, symbolic of something that they, uh, a theme they love. And, and, and the thing about prints is they appeal to people on so many levels. Well, that's almost an answer to my next question, Naoka, <laughs> which is, but it's not quite. Are we in the print world too, deeply down the rabbit hole of minutiae, states and variations and color variations and proofs and so on, when really what we ought to care about is all of it, including most of all the work of art. How do you approach that at the Getty? Or maybe you don't agree that we're not deeply enough into minutiae. 
Well, as someone who has worked, um, you know, part of my scholarship has really been technically focused. And so I am someone who has spent a lot of time thinking about states and process and the trace, the kind of uh, the trace of that evolution. Um, but I think, you know, there's there's the taxonomy side of of cataloging and identifying and differentiating. But I think where there's value to that is in the interpretation of it. Why, why are there so many states? What does this tell you about an artist's process? What even, you know, there's the elusive question of rarity and that seems to sometimes be considered an aesthetic criterion, but really what does rarity tell you about the history of taste and collecting or function of prints? Um, and, um, you know, how do these, you know, impressions, editions, in the early modern period where there's the opportunity for or the possibility of lifetime versus posthumous impressions. Again, of course, you know, one can look at that aesthetically and judge it critically from that point of view of this is early, this is late, but there's great historical significance to this in terms of, um, again, the history of taste and the fact that there was a continued interest. Excuse me, can everybody hear Naoko? Hard to tell from here, thank you. Um, so I, I think there is, like I said, I think there's value. I think in and of itself as an end to itself, there is a use, a function to being so attentive to states just because it does allow a collection like the Mets or the British Museum that has two million prints to keep their, their house in order. But I think there's more to be said about it than just to say this is X of Y. Uh, Jonathan. Um, yeah related question, and that is, let's go to our title. What is the impact of prints on your museum, on the National Gallery? I um, so admired the Cassatt exhibition some years ago from this same standpoint, which had Cassatt drawings, had Cassatt prints, Cassatt paintings all hung together in that exhibition part of which was curated by members of the IFPDA, uh, Mark Rosen, Susan Pinsky. But exactly. Can you riff on that for a minute or two? Well, a temporary exhibition, and particularly of a given artist, um, of even a given period, a given school, for its fullness, must have whatever media were used as expression. Um, However, and, and I, I've already, or we will share, the love of prints in and of themselves and as an art form, but prints are differently qualified from other media in this sense, I'd say, that they are more technically bound or there are more greater continuities of peculiar and unfamiliar technique. And those techniques have characteristics that transcend society, school style. So there are certain unities that I certainly feel more constant, compelling, and qualifying of the medium. So it's, it's both a response, certainly, cassade or exhibitions I have tried to do and on occasion succeeded in doing, um, where every medium that pertains or what I love looking at or what I love trying to understand is every possible manifestation of that school style personality. But the medium does have its own very distinctive conventions of a different kind from the other major media. Now, since it's our title, um, does anybody else wish to comment on, on the title, The Impact of Prince on Museums, Stephen? Well, um, I think I can only speak from examples. Um, the, an exhibition we did in 2012 on the Vollard Suite, um, which we had acquired in its entirety, we showed it, um, but in the context of objects from classical antiquity. So we had an uh, Etruscan mirrors, the backs of Etruscan mirrors, which are engraved, and they made a very eloquent um, statement beside work by Picasso, those extraordinary eloquent line etchings. Um, we had s classical sculpture, um, a head of Zeus, and so on. Um, we had works by 
um, from uh, by artists that greatly influenced Picasso, Rembrandt, Goya, Ingres, all from the collection. And I think it showed um, that artists uh, like Picasso um, were ranging freely through museums, uh, through material um, by their predecessors. And um, what it shows, the impact this has, is that a visitor coming in would see um, that suddenly the classical past isn't so far away. It isn't so distant. And there is a liveliness, a, um, a real charge between looking at um, a work from the past, classical past, and a work by, for, an art, for instance, an artist like Picasso. Okay, I would just say for Can people, hear Nadine at that level? Go ahead. people who are people who are not print enthusiasts often have like a view works on paper, especially prints, as sort of the problem, <laughs> right? You're, you're going to do a display with paintings and other things, and then the prints are the thing that can only stay up for six, or, you know, maybe six months at the most because of sensitivity to light. Uh, they're the thing that needs low lighting levels, and it's always, but it seems to me like people are not thinking about them in the right way. I mean, prints give you some insight, certainly into artist technique. Uh, the reason we're so interested in technique and how prints are made and, and the states and all of that is because uh, one of the reasons is then you go talk to an artist who happens to be here in the print, print place and they're like so excited to tell you about how they made these prints and it really gives you insight into how uh, things are made and why they're here and why they look the way they do. The other thing I think is for uh, modern art galleries, contemporary art galleries, it's a way that you can refresh your display of paintings with prints and change things around and make things look different uh, you know, over a period of many months. So I think actually people have to start thinking about, and we all have to start being the evangelists for prints as this positive contribution to what the museum looks like. Um, so Gary Tintero, I think some of you know Gary, uh, formerly at the Metropolitan Museum, a uh, great curator now, the director in Houston said that, quote, the most precious commodity in the art world is not money, it's not art, it's museum real estate. There's plenty of money, there's plenty of art, there isn't that much museum space. That is um, a concern that I've had for a long time, particularly um, with regard to the size of contemporary prints today. Um, so my question to all of you, and I'll begin with, uh, are there any contemporary prints at the getting and show us how little I know about the collection, I'm afraid, but. So um, we, do, we do have um, contemporary prints. Our collections um, at the Research Institute do cover from well, the- have to speak more about um, so the collections at the Research Institute do, where the Prince collection um, lives, does span from the Renaissance to the present. Um, and so we do collect contemporary editions. We do have dedicated gallery space for our special collections, and our collections are primarily paper-based. So um, we have rotations, and but that, you know, as is the case for all of all print curators, that's just surfacing a very small amount of our collection at any one time. And so really, I would say, you know, the, the, what animates, what keeps our collection animated is our study room, our reading room. And that, um, that is where we serve our researchers. And I'm getting to your point here about the, over, you know, large contemporary prints. That is, of course, a concern, not just for storage and display, but how we're able to serve researchers who come in and would like to study these works. And I think we're all, you know, it's exciting. And of course, I'm, I'm seeing Team Gemini here and thinking about how, you know, in the 1960s, the scale of prints just absolutely transformed how, you know, the visual impact and possibilities of prints. But of course, there is the issue that comes with it, which is the practicalities of, of, of storage and how 
one manages that, but that's an issue I, that's not specific to works on paper. I mean, that's all, all art. Um, so I, I don't know that there's anything really to that I can say specifically about the contemporary print Talk edition. So at the National Gallery, <coughs> Uh, are you now storing any prints off-site? Are you forced to that? What 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 space uh, restrictions there, do you there have? There are some. Oh, hold up your mic. Uh, no. Sorry. I'm, I'm, this is functional. Oh, it is. Mm -hmm. um, there are monumental works on paper, contemporary primarily, and they are framed and then stored off-site. But I want to go back to Tintero's comment, Gary's comment, about real estate. Um, an issue we face, and I think I've certainly faced in the past at other institutions, I think we, we all face, real estate in terms of storage, which is something that administrators, um, it's one of the ways in which uh, dangers of the typical way administrators look at works on paper. They are not out of sight, out of mind, but they are not constantly visible. They cannot be continuously exposed. You know, all, all the, we know all the terms. But it also means in terms of storage, they tend to be the last matter addressed, recognized and addressed by administrators. So sheer real estate, even for the storage of your solander boxes, or what would happen if you matted all of your large collection that should be matted for its protection, for its handling, for its viewing and exhibition in those few cases, small percentages. If in any of our large institutions that were adequate, it would be quite remarkable. So that real estate, I, I'm sure Gary is thinking, as directors love to, buildings and you know, running feet of, of exhibition space for the major so-called, or the, in fact, major media, but it's the storage and then also the temporary exhibition space. Appropriately uh, large, small, but articulated space for the exhibition of prints and drawings. And that is something that's an incredibly rare commodity uh, in, I, I think, all our, any institution I can, almost any institution I can think of. Right. Uh, Nadine, uh, at, at the Met, how far down can you dig for storage? <laughs> well, unfortunately, can't, can't we can't out. expand yeah. the building at all. And, and every, for every department, storage is at a premium. I think the difference with print is this expectation that someone can come to a study room and ask for anything in the collection and have it brought to them immediately. And we still try to do that, um, but we are running into the fact that we're going to have to put some very large things um, off-site, unfortunately. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's an issue um, just because works are large and, and uh, you know, and, and uh, print and drawing storages were made for works that were much smaller. <laughs> uh, most museums, I, I think a lot of the public do not know, most museums have uh, study rooms uh, in the print, print and drawing departments, and so the public is welcome to come in, make an appointment, ask to see something. At one time at the Met, Nadine, it was restricted to scholars and people with credentials. Mm. Is that any longer the case? Uh, really, um, anybody can come and make an appointment to come and view works at the Met and um, uh, by appointment, but um, really we are very welcoming. We have a fantastic study room staff who I'm sure many of you have experienced are, are knowledgeable, uh, helpful, um, really try to uh, do everything they can for the people who, um, who come and visit. We have classes, we have, um, you know, sometimes you walk through the study room, there's a group of people sketching. Next time you come through, there's someone giving a class. Next time there's an important scholar from Europe looking at, in all of our something or others. And, and so we really um, uh, try to accommodate everybody when we can. Here's a question that I tried out on our panelists, uh, <laughs> I don't know, starting a week or two ago. And they said, oh, I don't go to that. But here it is. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> but I hope in gentle words. How are the recent epical social and political changes in the world, many long overdue, affected your acquisition policies, if at all, have those changing circumstances and sensibilities affected your priorities, your decisions for what you buy, uh, your funding, your activities in general? 
Who would like to take that on? Okay, I'll assign Stephen first. <laughs> I'm not sure I can really answer that very um, succinctly. Um, the, the point is that uh, curators obviously respond to uh, what is going on around one. Um, the uh, one is always um, making or thinking about acquisitions um, through what you would like to see represented in the collection. Um, but in my case, it's large uh, making acquisitions has largely been to furnish upcoming exhibitions, not entirely, by any means, not entirely, but it's been so much uh, a, a process of identifying a particular area. Um, traditionally, this has been by what we used to call schools, might be um, the School of Paris, or modern Italian prints, or modern American prints, or Australian prints, or Israeli prints, and forming, uh, focusing on this and building it up to a certain point to justify doing an exhibition accompanied by a catalog and thereby introducing that school to uh, the a wider public. Um, and of course, in doing so, you are immersing yourself in that uh, culture, the, the art of that, um, from that, that uh, area, and um, you're, you are, will be building up with particular um, uh, questions in mind. At the same time, you're also building the collection across. Um, so if things turn, come up, you think really ought to be in the collection, then you will do your hardest to try and acquire them. And some of those things will be in response to changes in, in society, obviously. And I mean, um, you know, we've been, been acquiring for the museum um, African-American artists, for instance, which in the 1980s weren't represented in the collection. And so one makes a concerted effort to, to, to respond to this um, higher visibility of this uh, material. Um, I wasn't a succinct answer, and I didn't... No, no, no. <laughs> Excellent answer. Thank you, Jonathan. You're in the hot seat. Same thing at the National Gallery of Art, Washington, D.C. I, I, I second everything Stephen, uh, Stephen has said, Stephen's expressed. Um, the job, as I understand it, uh, of being a curator, um, is certainly, uh, or inevitably, we respond to our time and place. Administrators do. Museums do. Museums, uh, from the moment they, the, of origin through time, are not just reflect. The best ones capture sort of essential spirit values, zeitgeist, whatever you want to call it. They do sort within that, if it's an art museum, for the things that are of an aesthetic excellence. So that's sort of the one, one challenge that I feel strongly still subtends whatever of our time we should, we are trying to express. The other uh, in very important qualification is the nature of the institution, its existing co collections, its staff, the resources, its aptitudes. It is absurd to pretend that all museums, even if it's just art museums, should be pursuing the same thing at the same time and reflecting society equally well or in fact just practically competing with one another literally for the same prints on these walls or the same artist. I used to laugh what I think we, we would all note and I chuckle. Um, print Council of America would have its annual report and a certain contemporary print would come out and you'd go down the list and 10 different institutions would have that same print. Now, in most cases, or even all cases, they were absolutely excellent things. But did, does the, did that same print equally pertain to each of those institutions acquiring it? And was each equally equipped to make the appropriate sense of it, to present it as logically? So it, I, I, it, this is not an argument, but this is thinking in the direction of 
appropriate respect for one's traditions, one's collections, and what one's own capabilities are. Is one doing the work one acquires? However well or not it's reflecting society, if one cannot do it the proper service. Anybody else want to take a I would just say um, there are other forces um, that affect what we're, what we're acquiring, what our funds are. I know our department has very specific, often very specified funds uh, for certain kinds of works. That definitely uh, influences how we build up our collection. Um, also, also um, I would say, like loans, uh, our, you know, what J Jonathan just said, every museum is, is buying the same print. Well, uh, loans are being are more expensive and be, you know, it used to be at the Met um, uh, when, you know, early when I started working, there was a Rembrandt print and, and uh, the head of our department at the time said, well, uh, uh, Morgan Library has those Rembrandt prints. We don't need to buy it. You know, we can always borrow it. Now, I think there's a very different thinking. It's like, well, it's expensive to borrow it. And, and then you know, the registrar has to get involved. And then the council's office has to get involved. There's like so many people have to get involved with a loan from 30 blocks away that um, it ends up being a, um, you know, yet another hurdle for uh, doing things like that. So I just wanted to add that. Naoko, restrictions or limitations at the Getty in this regard? Um, I'm going to address the bigger question first. Um, and I think there's an opportunity with collecting prints that prints, printmaking has always been a very flexible medium, um, an arena for great experimentation, but also this, you know, the fact that prints were, have always been these containers and purveyors of information that are really responding to the time with a great flexibility to, you know, to your point previously, Nadine, about the fact that there's great scope to printmaking. And so I think when we're looking historically in terms of trying to tell more diverse narratives, more inclusive narratives, that the print has a very important role to play in that. Um, and also I think when, you know, there's the acquisition side of how we're thinking, you know, trying to broaden, open up our lens, but there's also how we're interpreting the materials that we already have in our collections and how we're engaging with the communities that we're trying to serve. So it's also the stories that we're trying to surface from collections. Um, and that's also part of our job as curators. It's not just building the collections. I mean, that's certainly very important because that's what we're trying to preserve and that, and that has so much to do with what histories have been recorded is the decisions that curators have made over centuries. But, you know, in the moment and in terms of trying to respond you know, with alacrity, so much of that can be done through through our programming as well. And I think it's important not to lose sight of that. Also, when we're talking about, you know, collecting multiples and the fact that multiple institutions can be preserving things, well, then if it makes sense, you know, certainly in Los Angeles, we, we think across institutions. So typically, we try to work collaboratively with LACMA and the Grunewald, who also have print collections, to not necessarily overlap in our acquisitions. Um, but we can also, each institution has its own you know, programming priorities. Okay, this next one, we're gonna go right down the line here, <laughs> starting with Jonathan. Uh, it's not a tough one, um, and uh, let's keep it to two or three word answer? <laughs> Impossible. Okay. I'll be good. Um, do collectors ask for your advice? Do you encourage them to ask for your advice? Do you give your advice or does that cross over too much into the commercial world? Jonathan. Yes, yes, and yes. Thank you. <laughs> no, the microphone. Certainly. That's... Was that certainly yes? Yes. <laughs> Of, of course, people come all the time uh, in our study room. They look at things. We can't give them values, but we can say, look at this print compared to the one we have. You know, yours is better. Why don't you give it to us? Yeah. <laughs> so if a major donor says, says to you, I really like this, I'd like to get it, is the price fair? Um, can you uh, comment? Yeah, yeah, of course, if it's someone who's, you know, but, but I wouldn't, I, someone can't bring us something and then they say, uh, what's the value of this? We're not allowed to give them uh, values. Naoko. Yes, and I would say it's a dialogue too. I mean, I can offer my advice, my insight, but there's, you know, 
collectors are extremely knowledgeable people and extremely enthusiastic people. And I think that there's so much to be gained from that conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay, before we go to the Q&A, which will open up to the audience, um, I'd like each of you in a few words to tell us what took you to Prince, okay? How'd you get to Prince? Why not something else in this vast uh, art world? Jonathan? Uh, let me also say that Naoko inspired the question. <laughs> she said she'd like to hear everybody's story. Oh. <laughs> Well, that's, that's more than a few words. Okay, um, I was drawn first in graduate school and uh, principally concerned, even through graduate school, with painting, Italian painting, 16th, 17th century. But, because I said it earlier, style, style. If an artist, a moment, any phenomenon fascinated me, I wanted to at least know or try to get to um, uh, every manifestation. It led to prints. I worked in the uh, print room of the Fog, or now it's Harvard Art Museums, where there were paid graduate interns. And that was my preference, that was my delight, because a world opened up, and I realized why I realized, or I still feel. I love the iceberg above the surface, which is painting, sculpture, but prints are everything below. They're more than the bedrock. It's what is, we can't even completely fathom. And both that openness, the depth, the quantity, the openness, and then the pertinence to everything above. I, I, I couldn't resist, and I continued. I care about all three media like three different children. But prints have this special uh, amplitude and these special resonances and connections that no other media does. Steven? Yes, well, I've, uh, sorry, I've been involved with Prince uh, as a curator for 40 years now. I started in 1982, uh, was recruited uh, to um, the uh, Department of International Prints and Illustrated Books at the National Gallery of Australia. Uh, I was hired, I was the first hire of the senior curator, Pat Gilmore. I had no prior experience of prints, um, but I loved the medium. And um, I wanted to work in a museum. Um, and the opportunity to work with so many different works, that was one thing that I could look at, whether it might be prints by Solowit or Degas etchings or, I mean, it was, you could range freely across the collections. Whereas I realized that curators of paintings and sculpture had a very narrow, restricted collection to work with. And so that was one thing. The works in prints were so much more numerous. Secondly, because there were works on paper, you were compelled to put on exhibitions. And so, because you couldn't put prints up permanently in a gallery. So, you were constantly going into the collection, finding new things, um, questions arising from the material we were looking at. I'll give you a very short um, example. In 1983, um, at the National Gallery in Canberra, uh, under Pat Gilmore, we did a series of exhibitions devoted to the history of particular techniques. The first one I was involved in was the four. There were four over the period of seven years. The first one was the screen print. The second one was on the relief print. And the lino cut emerged going through the boxes at the National Gallery in Australia, and I saw all these prints by the Grosvenor School artists, of which there was simply nothing in the literature. I got interested in it, and I started to research it. I put on a small display of this material, and from that I researched it, discovered that the material was scattered all over the world, um, and 10 years later, I published a catalogue raisonné on 
the seven artists um, associated with the founder of the Grosvenor School, Claude Fly. Um, so, and then the, the other fact is that working with Prince means, as a curator, you're constantly coming up with um, new things uh, to add to the collection to, um, that you know would feed into what is already there, but also what is not there. Um, Thank you very much. Um, I think I know the answer, but I'm not sure, Nadine, but uh, how did you get <laughs> you, uh, you know part of the answer. I will say uh, four things. Number one, when I was in high school, I went to the High School of Music and Art here in New York City, and um, a friend of mine from high school remembers me saying I wanted to be a curator at the Met. So, <laughs> tick. <laughs> uh, number two, uh, went to graduate school. And, and when I started graduate school, uh, it was clear I was interested in works on paper, things that are like very personal. I think it was either going to be manuscripts or, or drawing, something like that. And then uh, my great advisor, Egbert Haverkamp Begemann, uh, organized his first class with David Tunick. And our class cataloged David's uh, collection of uh, Goldsius and Goldsius School prints. And that was really the introduction to like all the aspects of prints, the, you know, the, the techniques, um, the publishing of prints, all of these things, which in fact fed into my dissertation later on. Um, uh, number three was um, uh, at the Institute of Fine Arts where I went to graduate school. I had already decided to work on prints and um, there was a, a curatorial studies program. Uh, the second class in the curatorial studies program was to help a curator at the Met work on an exhibition and just by complete chance that year David Keel was teaching the class um, working on turn of the century American posters and the first day of that class he pulled out for our class uh, the firework prints the 18th century German valentines like these incredible things from the Mets uh, print collection and it was like oh my god I have got to stay in this place. And then number four was um, a good friend of my mother's, um, the art critic Arlene Raven, who passed away uh, some years ago. Uh, she said to me, um, really good to go into, to be a curator of works on paper, because by the time you finish with your dissertation, people will be retiring and there'll be jobs opening up. And sure enough, that happened. <laughs> now, Uncle, how did you get to Prince? I can... In, in retrospect, in the rear view mirror, I can pinpoint quite with some specificity the moment it started. And that was as a junior, as an undergraduate at Vassar College, the late Francesca Consagro, who was briefly a curator there, taught a course on the history of print in the Western world, entirely out of the Francis Lehman Loeb art collection. And it was the only course at the time that I, that I knew of that I could take where I didn't have to sit in an auditorium, in a classroom, looking at slides. And it was a total revelation. Of course, we were encouraged to look at works of art, but the entire course, I could learn all about, you know, centuries of art from the collection. And I would say from there, you know, my interest and my knowledge has been encouraged and supported really by very generous, enthusiastic, knowledgeable teachers who have encourage that access to the collection. And it's that community, I think, that we're seeing here um, of people who like to come together to look at things together and discuss them, which has always kept me interested. And um, so, you know, from my undergraduate to my graduate degree, I've always been focused on printmaking. I was a fellow at the British Museum working with Stephen 20 years ago. I was at the National Gallery working then with um, Peter Parshall, um, prior to Jonathan's arrival. Um, so I've just, I think it's both the, you know, that the, the really the intimacy of the experience, but also just the enthusiasm of the people who have, I've worked with, I've had the privilege to work with and who have nurtured that interest. Thank you very much. Um, any questions from the audience? If not, I have a lot more. I would love to hear your comments about well, I don't want to name names, but there's an amazing exhibition of Alex Katz's work down the street. There's, there's a few prints in the show. Is that, are you critical of that as print gurus or print evangelists? Or you can think back of uh, Donald Judd show that was at a major institution. There were 10 prints in the show. He made prints his whole life. Um, and there probably won't be another Donald Judd ret retrospective in the city for another decade. 
So is that is that a crime? You know. <laughs> I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but Nadine seems to. I saw. Her uh, <laughs> yeah, we, this happens a lot, <laughs> and um, you know. What are you supposed to do? We're not the curators of those shows. So, um, you know, I, as what I was saying before is that I think we all have to make the point to, uh, you know, paintings people that uh, prints actually add something to the exhibition and don't, uh, you know, shouldn't be the pro. I think, you know, what often happens is, oh no, uh, prints are gonna have to have low light levels and we're gonna have to make a special room for them and, and then we're gonna have to switch them out and, and like they end up being the problem child of the, of the exhibition. And I think that may be one reason why they don't get added. You know, it happens all the time, but I think um, we have to, you know, change minds, you know, get, get people to think more positively about uh, the contributions of prints and how it really changes uh, what we know about the artists. And, and often, when you talk to artists, they say, um, I work through some of my ideas through printmaking. You know, that's... Could I just add to that? Um, I've just seen the, uh, Hops, the Hopper exhibition at the Whitney. Um, and the, the few etchings that are displayed there make such a compelling case as to the direction he took as a painter. Um, and so uh, I think, um, you know, uh, prints um, play as an essential part in looking at an artist's work where clearly um, printmaking is uh, crucial to their um, artistic Tra trajectory. Um. Thank you. Um, we're not going to get to a subject that everybody here wanted to address, and that is NFTs and digital art. <laughs> so we'll leave that for another time. I want to thank all of you, spectacular scholars and curators who agreed to be on this panel today, and thank you to the audience for. Thank you, David.